Hello and welcome to episode number five of Midiera Meets, the monthly music podcast where we talk to a wide range of people from the music industry. This month I'm speaking to Mylar Melody, who's an all-round synth guru, particularly in the modular world. And if you've been on YouTube and you've seen any videos related to synthesizers, you'll know who this guy is. He's also written for a number of music magazines, as well as playing in a synth band of his own. And in his day job, he demos synth products all around the country. I got up with him in his London home to talk about his career and to talk about synthesizers and all kinds of musical things. So let's check it out. Thank you very much for for talking to me today. No worries. Thank, Thank you, you for having me in my house. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm visit- I'm just doing a tour of people's houses basically and interviewing You're basically them. Basically, just getting lots of free cups of tea. Free tea. Yeah, this is why I'm doing it. That's free fine. tea and um, that's free. Cool. Free noodling and looking at gear. Yeah. This is what I like Think doing. Think of worse things. Cool. So your uh, alias Mylar Melodies. Yes. I believe you're um, heavily into modular synths. I am. That's that's what I'm sort of picking up. I'm. Yeah, I am. I mean, you're you're literally framed by them right now. So it's <laughs> like, I agree. Although people can't see that. Yeah, I am. I'm like, but I I've been making music for like 16 years. I haven't always been a modular person like mm-hmm. so um i started when did i start i was like 16 and my like i was quite a late bloomer i um i can admit to having liked really terrible music when i was a kid mm-hmm. like would you, would you care to share any of those like i'm fairly <laughs> sure that at christmas i mean i say this as if it isn't a statement of fact that i asked for like the mr blobby um, and helped to get to Christmas number one because I thought it was crazy and fun, which I think he was quite funny as a child. I think we're probably similar yeah, age. Yeah. I think I probably liked Mr. Blobby at one time or another. Absolutely, <laughs> and also it's like it's probably quite an electronic record now that I, if I went back and listened to it, I remember <laughs> it. No, I started hearing it then. Mr. When you mentioned Blobby, it. Mr. Blobby. <laughs> That's all I can remember is that they say Mr. Blobby in it. Mm. But, I mean, it's a diabolical piece of music and I apologise, but you can't really... The thing that I wonder about that is, like, how... Because, you know, your music tastes, I don't know how they form necessarily, and I was just thinking about how... um, Why did I like electronic music? I I Mm -hmm. can't give you a good answer for that because I think it's too ingrained... Um, I wonder that. I don't, do you have any inclinations of why you like ele- why I like electronic music? Because um, you always know, like, oh, I like know. I like that band. But how did you? Why do you have the predisposition to like that band, which happens to be? Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, I think for me, it's like an otherworldly thing. It's like something that came out of. It, it sounds so different from guitar music, like hearing things like Laurie Anderson, the O Superman, as a mm. child, and thinking, wow, that's this is challenging me to listen to i think and and just things like jean michel jar yeah you know like i did used to listen to his his music as a child <laughs> on cassette and just be like wow i'm in space yeah. i'm in space now i'm flying a that's spaceship. quite cool that's, you close your eyes and you're like transported that's yeah. nice that's yeah, what music yeah, should yeah. be it's like i don't think we listen to music very productively anymore at least we don't focus on music in the same way yeah it's definitely also, i'm going on a slight tangent but it's just like it's a shame in a way that it, in an ironic way, it's a shame we have such good access to music because it isn't so special when we just... It's not so. It's harder to find newer things. Does that make sense? Because there's such an oversaturation mm. of things. Are kids going to have that thing of just going, oh, my God, the new sound. The magic The, the magic new sound. I've discovered the new sound. It's like, that isn't necessarily... Is that going to happen? Yeah. I mean, what what for you would be those magic sounds? What, what are the salient moments? I... Well, all right. So, for me... Um, Uh, One of the things that I've been sort of slightly obsessing about is electro um, and the music. So the first music, when I was 16, like the first music I got into, and we haven't even explained who I am, I suppose, but we can get to that. But um, Mm -hmm. just go go with me. We'll talk about that at the end. But the the, the music I got into was like Orbital and Aphex and sort of all, you know, that kind of very electronic, electronic. Um, But... Uh, the thing that's been sort of buzzing me lately in and in, in the thing I've gotten into the latest is it's like older electro. And I realise actually that when you listen to like Insides by Orbital, that that is that kind of sound. Mm-hmm. And there's a certain, there's basically one 
EP that if you just listen to that EP, that is exactly what I'm talking about. And it's yeah. um, it's Der Zyklus, D-E-R-Z-Y-K-L-U-S. Um, I don't know if it even has a name, um, but it's the one that's got Fallen van der Welder and Mitzaplik or whatever the heck it's <laughs> called on it as well. Like these are, um, if you just listen to that EP, and I'm sure we can link to it and mm-hmm. all that sort yes, of thing, but um, be linked. link to that um, <laughs> and listen to that. It's on everything, like everything is on YouTube. Yeah. There is a sort of sparse bleakness. Those tunes are so incredible because they are like little jewels. They're like Swiss watches mm-hmm. in the sense that they're all of them parts are utterly essential and there is nothing superfluous. So, when, yeah. and, and I had a go quite recently with a friend of mine who was in here and we had a go at recreating one of those tunes and it's really hard to do even though there's only like four elements because mm-hmm. like the pad sound that he, he's using is obviously like a sample and it's a sample of whatever it is and I have no idea what it was but if you don't have that exact sample there are certain harmonics in that sample that when you, you know, and with the chords that he played it just has this it's some of these tunes are so spooky and they they touch on like this impossible emotion there's like something that i've heard Aphex talk about with his music is like he says what i like about the music is invoking a nameless emotion it's like an emotion that i can't quite put my finger on mm-hmm. is it sad is it melancholy is it you know yeah. and it's it's almost like the best tunes of that genre are like sort of dreams that you listen to them and they sort of just invoke this like nameless, like almost horror, mm. but it's not horror. It's just like a, a sort of an unknown place. I, I have a weird like thing in my head. Like, do you remember Trapdoor? Yeah. Do you remember? Yes, yeah. Plastic <laughs> I, mean, I, love monsters. Tra- I love Trapdoor. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. did you ever, were you ever slightly weirded out by the place that it was set in? Like this, the way it was never named. You never knew where it was. And it was it was not necessarily on Earth. It, yeah, it he was, was like a butler, wasn't he? So there was yeah. a voice that shouted down to him and was Burke, like, "Feed me." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like, and Burke's like this, like bumbling, charming. It's like a charming show, hmm. but I was always slightly. I was I enjoyed watching, but I was always marginally disturbed because it is really weird. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of quite weird stuff happening. But what I'm trying to get, like, put my finger on is this unnamed sort of dread based on the setting, which Mm. was a place that was never explained and was probably meant to be another dimension. And it's it's like that. And it's this idea of this unnamed, just trying to put your finger on this unnameable dread, which certain bits of art are good at, are capable of invoking. And definitely there are certain electro tunes that have been, have kind of struck a chord with me where I'm like, I can't like this is so good, yeah. and this is but this is this is taking me to a place I cannot explain. And I've I've experienced with some TV, but not a lot else. David yeah. Lynch films also kind of get you definitely, get, get yeah, definitely. I know Charlotte Hathaway was talking about um, David Lynch recently, and she mentioned Lost Highway, which for me yeah. is like a great film because it really doesn't make sense. It's sort of about the human mind mm. not remembering things properly and distorting memories and. And different versions of events from different people are totally different. And yeah. I love that film because there's there's no closure in it. And, you know, that, that's the beauty in it. Like all good Lynch stuff, it's a, it's a mystery. And it's meant to remain a mystery. And you're not supposed to... There's not... There is not an answer. Yes. And David Lynch yeah, doesn't... I think he doesn't like you asking because there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. That's, the, that's like the salient thing I think you learn when you get older. It's like, like wow, everyone's been looking for this answer for so long. The moment you find pieces when you realise that there is not, there is yeah. not no answer. It's also, like that, and it's also but. nice to be like bamboozled, isn't it? Boring to be given all the answers. I don't want all the answers. I want to be like kept in. I think it's interesting to because then you can have a debate. Yeah, you can't really have a debate when there's an, a right and a wrong answer. Finished. You, yeah, like the end. to a degree, but you. I want there to be no real answer necessarily. And then mm. and then it's up to you to read what you want into it. Surely exactly. that's more gratifying. Yeah. And also, it's, it's, it annoys me that people that are annoyed by that because then it's just like, <laughs> it's like, why can there not be art that doesn't have an answer? It's like, why do you need an answer? Isn't it fun to just like, you know, I suppose it's akin to taking drugs and just sort of seeing, it's trying to... It, you know, you're only just trying to replicate the same kind of thing of just trying to like explore possibilities, spaces, and and you know explore your own mind. Hmm. And it's like it's if you're given the answers, you don't get that 
opportunity to be imaginative anymore. Yeah. Do, you know I mean? just... do you think then that that's maybe what's appealed to you about modular? Because the unknown. making yeah, and, and making music in the DAW have this finite beginning and end in a track, don't you? And you yeah. know you've got this five minutes to fill or the six minute and you can see all the bar differences. God, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, f to give a more, like, specific answer, like, that modular there, which is my... So we're looking at, like, my live... I've got, like, a two cases which are all strung together as a live system. Mm. And that thing... Um, is a good example of it because what you can do with what you can do anything with a modular pretty much because there's like there are so many with specifically talking about euro act modular that there are literally thousands of modules there yeah. is just you can do excuse me anything so the beauty of that is that i mean the bad thing about it is it's really hard to get started because no one knows what to buy because there's too many things to buy but mm -hmm. if you get your head around enough of it you can build anything and that literally so you can design your dream music making machine yeah um and so that is the killer thing and for me you've got you've got a much higher chance of achieving flow you know that whole idea of like the flow state i.e i mean that you can get that in a daw don't get me wrong but a daw you know, you've only got that one interaction point of mm -hmm. the mouse and the keyboard, and I think you're limited. It's like trying to—it's the joke about programming, like the JV1080 or something. It's like trying to program. It's like trying to paint a house through a letterbox. is yeah. what they they say. As. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's, I think it is a bit like that trying to use a computer. But the the key thing is that you could absolutely could design a computer groove box system, and design a physical controller to do that and there's I, i'm surprised not more people are doing that like you should mm -hmm. especially when there's quite a lot of modular midi controllers because yeah. if you do do that you can build a system where you can just kind of close your eyes and go on a musical journey and the beauty of that modular case over there is the fact that you can just stand in front of it and it's designed for live improvisational techno music and you can just yeah you in theory should be able to keep playing until power runs out and you turn into like a dried husk yeah, yeah, you just you keel just, over on top of like, it and it yeah. still go, it probably go it's it like, would just carry it on it would go on it would and carry you on could, if you maybe set up enough of a generative patch it would just literally carry on playing while you humanity rots and the cockroaches eat you all um, yeah I did I did want to ask about generative yeah. music so I mean we've touched on so many things already I because I, like for me Electro music is like my heart and soul of yes. electronic music, yeah. like Africa Bambata and yeah. early yeah. electro the earlier stuff. Electro stuff when it's just an eight oh eight. I was like synth. looking. I was on Mixcloud and I was looking for like electro, and I think the world has a very different definition of what electro is. Because like electro isn't it? is like EDM. It's like, it's I'm like, a horror, this yeah. is not electro. I know. I'm the same. as such a purist. It's <laughs> like, like no, it has to be have, pre. It has, has to, to be pre the nineties. <laughs> it the should have electro. a quadriverb and like a two operator FM pad in it. It's like it's got to have these qualities. Exactly. And be bleak and have like. I did see a really good description where someone's like deadpan delivery vocals. I'm like, yes, that is a hallmark of. Of yeah. good electro and cowbells, just, too. cowbell just ding, ding, like, ding, 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 like ding. there's also like a lot of playfulness as well, especially on like yeah, it's fun. Uh, it sounds that, fun and, like. on that same EP. There, are, there are playful tunes are uh, mixed in with the bleakest, mm -hmm. the brilliantest, bleakest ones, but they're all funky as well because there's just that soul. There is a huge amount of soul and funk built into them. Mm. Like Bambata is like just pure, pure soul and funk. So it's it's anything but. Uh, human it's not electronic it's not um machine like you mm. know it is it's like it's such a brilliant marriage because it's you're you're lensing like afro funk through this like rigid japanese technology and it's like but yet yeah the, the human quality will always it does prevail it's like and that's the best thing it's like you know these are just tools And also about Aphex Twin and um, yeah. uh, uh, the ambient works, all that stuff. It, it does evoke. I was listening to it at work yesterday, mm. and it does evoke uh, f 
an odd feeling like i'm not feeling happy there's there's hmm. there's one chip what is it blurred stone or, or something right. like that or stone i don't know any of the names of them no neither do i but i only know because <laughs> i would focus I, whatever it is. yeah stone in focus that's stone the one focus, that's it yeah yes. yeah and um it's just like three chords the whole way through yeah. and they're all very different oh, feelings each yeah. of these chords and it goes around those three <clears> the whole time and the first chord's lovely it's really warm and it sounds great and you sort mm. of get it encapsulated by it and the second one's like mysterious but then the third one's like really cold and dark but then so you like it's this weird circle that just occurs and like which one is the first one and which one's the last Mm. one it definitely does evoke selected ambient works too i mean that is to shout that out as well is a really good example of that unnameable emotion thing like Mm -hmm. it's so good like holy crap there is some stuff on that where i'm just like I don't know, how did you even write this? Yeah. Like, how does a person even write this? Is that the one with Heliospan? Is, is that on the second no, one? No, I think that first? isn't that on the first one, yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, particular, I mean, Select Time It Works 1 is an excellent Electro record as well. Like, that is a very much in the vein of Electro that we were talking about as well. It doesn't really get credited mm-hmm. as an Electro album, I don't think. But, but yeah, 2 is, is, for unnameable emotions, is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, made with, like... Also, another great thing as well to shout out about Selecting Element Works 1. So I was talking, um, tweeting about it, and um, Zoe Blade, who does um, Transistor Sounds Labs, um, she was talking about how um, she's a big nerd about Aphex and was like, kind of done a lot of research and knows, knows this stuff, that basically nothing on that album is, or very little of it is probably analog. That, like, the drums are... You know, there's evidence to point because you can hear the drums being pitched up and down that it's mm. not an 808. Yeah. And he wouldn't have had an It was like an R8, which is like the sort of digital. Yeah, I had sample. an R8. It's such a yeah. great piece of gear. And it's supposed to be amazing. I've never tried one, but it's oh, like. It's fantastic. The, the really point is, good. it's not It's not a sexy machine. And it's not. No it's one's. A brick. Yeah. It's a brick. The velocity pads are horrible. Mm-hmm. There's like no. They're velocity sensitive, but there's no like, um, what's it called, travel on them. There's no travel. So it's like you're just hitting a concrete slab. It's just like um, differently. But breaking it has, your finger more or less, depending on how. Yeah. In actual fact, one of my first and most popular YouTube videos, even now, is me <coughs> dicking about on an R8. Yeah. For the same reason that I read about the way you started off making YouTube videos, which is because you wanted to sell it. I was trying to sell some So, gear. yeah, <laughs> it, it, that's exactly how I did it. I was like, wow, that's weird. Let's get rid of this. I just made those videos to get to sell it. And it turns out, you know, they like take on a life of their later, own. It's like tens of thousands of views for yeah. you just for a little eBay thing that you really regretted selling 10 yeah, years later. Then you watch the video, you're like, <laughs> yeah, that, was, that good. was good, actually. I was good then. <laughs> that was good. But it's the point, all I'm saying is like, if you're at all interested in the modular thing, is it's very likely you don't need to build a modular synth. And it'll only... Well, actually, here's some caveats. Well, one, one bit of advice. And, and actually, one of the things about building that, that live system, what was really great about building the live system was it reminded me that modular is great if you've got a purpose. Mm-hmm. That I wanted to make a live modular <clears throat> techno system, so I built one. If you just get into it because it's cool and everyone's doing it, you'll waste a lot of money and feel... Well, you might not. You might find a purpose, mm-hmm. but you you should have a purpose. And like a goal to, or, or a like goal. something that you want to achieve a system, with Because it. you're becoming yeah. the system designer. Like when you design a modular synth, you effectively become a synth designer and you get... It's, it's one of the funnest things. You get to spec it up and you get to say, oh, this is the ergonomics and this is how it will look and this is the chassis it will be in and these will... You can change the knobs. This is the aesthetic it will have. Mm. So you get to play God and make your ultimate synth, which is it very is appealing. It's a little bit like that, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's a bit it's like exactly. sort of champion. Championship manager for sin. It's exactly that. <laughs> but it's like if you don't have a plan, you know, you are gonna, you know, get relegated. I think it's that's just... a, <laughs> I think that's a good point. I've never and I and I know people who fall into both camps. Yeah. Um I watched recently I know you talked about Surgeon being someone who you, who really yeah, inspires he's a, he's you modular wise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember seeing him at House of God a long, long, long time ago, like and yeah. he was layering stuff up in Ableton then. Mm. And even then it was like, wow, he's brilliant. And now obviously he's reverted almost totally to exclusively fully, like, to, to modular. To modular. Yeah. But yeah, he said the same thing about like giving himself a limit in terms of like the case size. Did you watch that the Bristol? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. That was a great, great it was a really like, good point. If you want to put something in, you've got to take something, something out. out. 
It's great. Um, because That's... I know people who just get case upon case upon yeah. case upon case. You're doing case. it for the wrong reasons. And... Because the, the, the point with the live thing is if you're doing it properly, you you only add a case because you know what the thing you need to add is. Do you know what I mean? You, mm. like, you are not going to just arbitrarily add stuff because it looks cool. Mm. And that's what I mean about it being so so like gratifying. And, and, and it, it kind of renewed my love of modular again because I was like, oh, like, honestly, like the other big case you see there is largely exists to house modules that I make videos about. Yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty much why it's it there. It's very impressive. It's uh, visually very impressive, but it's not um it's not a system. I mean it kind of is. There, you can sort of see that there's some semblance of design. Mm -hmm. But the live thing is like, okay, I need this because I need to do that. Yeah. So how am I gonna solve that problem? Oh 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 hell, there is a module which does that, or there's something that's similar and I'll try it and then I'll go down a garden path and it's like if you have a purpose, it's really good. If you don't have a purpose, it's it's a waste of money mm. and it will just frustrate you. And I th Yeah, I think that's definitely a, a, a salient point. And all I would say just to be constructive is that what you might want to consider doing, if you want to make a groove box specific, specifically, um, buying a modular is expensive. There are so many really amazing boxes mm -hmm. that you can get the same experience, i.e. Volkers. Volkers, yeah. Volkers. The OP-1. OP-1. Teenage Engineering yeah, OP-1. It's sort of like a modular, yeah. it's a whole thing in itself, isn't it? Digitact. A Digitact. Just that would mm. be an amazing thing to, like, would give you a lifetime of ideas to explore. It's really well made and it sounds amazing. Yeah. It's great. And I'd actually, when I was playing on the Digitact, I was like... God, like genuinely a little bit I'm like, why am I even bothering with the watch? <laughs> <It's laughs> yeah, yeah. like, this is this is the the experience that I've been looking for mm. because it's it is that like wordless flow state. And I'll go here now. I'll go there and I'll just be I'll be this like lightning rod mm. to just make music. And it's yeah. like being a conduit, which is what you want. Like I think you want to just not be thinking and you just want to be. Definitely, especially all like with clunky design, like like the sort of eighties black boxes <clears> which <throat> you and I both own. Yes, so difficult to program. So yeah, the user actually, interface is so counterintuitive. And I, hope, going along the I menu honestly just... don't use them much. It's like I don't use them a huge amount in my music making process. Yeah, I'd like to, but I will. Use, I will approach that in a more practical way. So like one of my next ideas is I want to use push, which is uh, push is amazing, and mm. that's a. Like if you if you are married to the computer, like just get a push. Like honestly, like it's amazing because yep. it's like a circlon or one of these hardware sequences. It's like using an MPC in the sense that you can create that flow state. You can just make music with that interacting with that piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. You don't have to look. The monitors, at, the computer yeah. monitors turned off. off. You might You've got as well high resolution yep. screen. And it's yes, there is a screen, but it's it's just enough information to to give you what you need, not to not be because the the poison of a screen is that you just end up staring and you you almost visually led. I'm quite a visual person. You become visually led by the blocks mm -hmm. and you're not listening. Yep. Like yep, I mean, there definitely. are certain tenets like you should say you should like close your eyes when you. Um, play back like mm -hmm. you should in fact I did see someone had done like a Max for Live thing which makes the screen go black I think oh, when, you, when you hit play I may there, be is, there is also an on off button I don't know if people are aware of that yeah, well, there, a bit of patching time yeah exactly <laughs> but yeah I did I did exactly have that question about the essential element of music is the sound really isn't it, it is. so perhaps that's the, the appeal of modular is that you are getting Absolutely. Yeah, you, the sound you just, you, you, it is a way of making music where you're not you're not being basically led by the same bad habits that you developed over years of using a computer and it's just a, mm. it was probably the same reason that well maybe not but you could make a slightly sketchy argument that people left hardware because there were habits that they had and we're always just looking for something new because mm. i mean we crave novelty but you could also say it's just like oh it, if i get that new thing it will like invigorate my process i'll be able to do so much more it's that sort of hollow promise but yeah certainly i've definitely gotten into habits with DAW based computer music making, which could be broken by different systems. You know, mm. and, and that, or if you work with someone else, for example, and you see their processing, oh, that's yeah. a good way of working. I'm I like always the way that they've done yeah. that, and you start to. Well, in in magazines, I'm always interested in those like artist interviews because I'm, I'm most interested to hear how they make music mm -hmm. and like what is the process by which they start. That is always quite interesting. It's like how do you yeah. start a track? And I, I would love like genuine my little like 
sort of fantasy that I like keep in my head is like imagine like <laughs> if they did like one of those feature music in the studios with Aphex, Aphex and I could just sit and watch and him. he didn't bullshit it yeah, he, and it, was, it really was just like the a hidden camera <laughs> and it was just Richard making some tunes and I think it I reckon actually it would be like oh oh really I don't know I'd, I'm not sure like, I want to see I want to see him I, I don't want to see it I, I'll, I'll be honest I wouldn't want to see that I definitely want to see it I 100% want to see it I don't want, want the it. magic to be like I want him to be there's no magic it's just but I just want to see <laughs> see how he like I want to see him fleshing out a melody and going hmm and can he play the keyboard do you reckon he can really play because he all the piano pieces are disc clavier it's like mm-hmm. it's all midi but do you reckon he did play them and then tighten it up can he would you feel out the chords how did he do it can he actually I, play the piano can I he play these like keyboards I would speculate I think he can I, I, I know that piano he's lessons? sort of not no one's asking I don't that, think I don't he's think. classically trained but yeah. I don't know I don't, there's so many questions about him I think that's why he's so, he's so heralded because he's, he's still, still this figure of enigma yeah. and he's huge you know like I think I yeah I don't know if I would want to see him in the studio I it's a good point would. Would he definitely that. would, I would love that. <laughs> But yeah, I think yeah, the visual not having the visual element is good. What about things like um, reactable? And have you have you? I have. have you tried that? Nah, I'm not, well, I've seen one, but I just think those things are kind of gimmicky because they're too limited. That you can't the be- like maybe I'm being I'm selling them short, but I mean those things. I think they're good, but I just think they're a poor substitute to like a proper groove box or something. Like you could have like if the aim of the game is to have a really is to just make music in a flowing, free form way, mm-hmm. then you might it, well, it doesn't matter what you do it with. I just don't I think a React table is just not gonna give you that. I think it's too limited. There's there's just basically basic melodies and maybe a sort of basic beat. You need more control than that. Yeah. But there is a point where you don't want to have too much control. Like mm. there are like Eurorack modules that I resent for having too many controls. <laughs> like literally I you know, and it's They're you, like the black boxes of the eighties, yeah. aren't they? You like, just like give me what's well, like the DX seven. If you if you like blow up in a DX seven it's got like a hundred and whatever it is, hundred and twenty eight parameters that mm. can be controlled. It's I like, have made a software editor for the DX seven. Uh, yeah, so I've got you, them all on how many screen. Is it then? Got on YouTube. I don't know. I always do it I, I religiously do it for my my eighties black boxes. I just make editors for them because I'm so tired of the yeah, freaking like, man here and But all then that the stuff. Volker Volker FM is a good example of that's how to distill a, a sort of classically difficult editing design a difficult ui mm-hmm. into just whatever it is five knobs or simplicity six, yeah simplicity. it is really good and it's that works really well with the rp as well which yeah. is it works fantastic plug for the rp there yeah little plug for the rp yeah <laughs> I want to ask you what 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 would be the core elements for you? Not not necessarily like the the ones that you like best or anything, yeah. but in a modular setup for you, what are the core elements that somebody would need to purchase in starting off? So how would, as in is the question like how do you get started, or what is the most interesting stuff? Or what? no, like, <clears throat> what do you what would you require to to have something that will make you beat a synth Ooh, line yeah. and a bass <clears throat> line? What ele- what core elements would you need in a modular? Well, to be honest, if you, if you are thinking about getting an actual modular modular, you should <clears throat> you should get the synth bit because to make a drum machine a modular drum machine is a bit. There are some like integrated like drum modules like the little drummer boy, which is like a bunch of of like sounds in one module. But I think it's just mm. not a great sounding thing. You'd be way better off getting like a TR eight or, or whatever you know, getting a drum machine drum machine, mm-hmm. and then just build your synth groove box to to do that um or you could get like and this is just spitballing here but you could get like a um a generative basically the drum sound should be in another box don't get a eurorack one but build a synth like Mm -hmm. because the, the the synth voice stuff is the most it's the thing that most people i think get into eurorack for is building like a rad analog synth voice that you can mangle and push around um and it, it, you're just going to have a more gratifying time if you do that first, because to build a drum machine by nature involves having a lot of modules. And there's a lot of really good, affordable drum modules, um, mm-hmm. like, you know, you can get the tip-top 808 bass drum and hats and the snare drum, and that'll probably cost you 350 quid, but you might as well just get a TR-8, because then you've got a drum sequencer. Um, yeah. 
we'll get like a beat and, step pro and then but I, all i'm saying is that the to get the drum sounds is a bit prohibitive and it's not likely it's going to be what you would first do you should just stick to, to like standalone boxes for that mm -hmm. but yeah you can build a, a voice that would be a valid thing to do but it's just then what voice do you build and it's like choosing a filter uh, choosing an oscillator i would just be led by uh, i don't know like all I, I would like some tenets to say is that there's no such thing as a bad oscillator that's just i've never you know it's not me who said this but like i've never heard an oscillator i didn't like I, I i really 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 don't think you should sweat tremendously about your vcos and just try and find like the cheapest like ones you can get like buy the old dope for ones like the a110 they sound really good mm -hmm. like and they've got the a110's got octave switches which so many of them don't and it's so nice to be able to flick octaves up and down it's yeah just, all the just classic like, synths have that don't yeah, they immediately like, just... and then it's just like boom now it's a bass synth like for live like i would love that on all of my oscillators i bought a module specifically that mm -hmm. shifts things up and down by octaves like mm -hmm. the beast shortboard just because that is a, a killer feature um so just get the dope for one and then just get like a the dope for filter that most appeals to you because they're all cheap like they're all 60 70 80 quid and there's kind of a dope for filter for every classic synth and it's like sh101 uh there <laughs> is not actually a do you know what there isn't a cascaded like ota that's a very good point that's my the, favorite film a million other people my favorite filter <laughs> okay so um yeah <laughs> But for don't actually do, I mean, there are a bunch of people who do like specific rolling filters, like the, I've got one, this one I've been playing with is the Jove, mm -hmm. which is like the Jupiter 6, so it's System 80 Jove, that's the guy who's making like the Eurorack 808 as well, like, um, an analogue. You're really? Right. Yeah. Because like, I'm. I saw in an interview you mentioned you have a Yocto. Is that right? Yeah. Is I've that got, the 808? I have a broken Yocto because I've not built it yet. Um, wow. Yeah. You can see the chassis. Uh, where, I love it. I, I just where thought it? it was such a great device when I saw it. It's wait, where the hell is it? But I, I that literally jumped out of the page. I was reading the interview. I was like, oh, whoa, Yocto! No <laughs> way! Because someone's asked me to build a Yocto, yeah. the 909 and the 808 for them. I've literally but lost they've, it. They've yeah. been out of <laughs> stock for so long. It's and it. Where, literally, where is it? I think it may be in the corridor or something. Oh, okay. It's gone corridor from. of uncertainty. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> as you can see, I have very few surfaces, and it's like very little free time, like the video stuff, to like solder it. But I, yeah, I've yeah, got yeah. all the bits. It's ridiculous. I have just, you? yeah, I, I need nice. to just do it. It's just, um, and I'm really well, genuinely just... excited about having that. Like that's a thing I want. To, when I have that, I'm just like. My electro, my electro dream is just like complete. I've got a DX7, yeah. I've got like SH101 modules like the Atlantis, you know, um, and then I'm basically, you know, I'm James Stinston, Gerald Donald. It's <laughs> just like I just need to like have the funk. That's all. Yeah. Um, Which will probably, yeah. I mean that that's a. I mean, there's a lot of soldering in there, isn't it? I think yeah, when when the guy asked me to do it, I did email them and say how long is it going to be, and they were. Like to solder it's like 40 hours yeah. of, of soldering or Someone something. said it's kind of like on and off for about a month. Yeah. I think that's cool. It's like, and I've, I've equated it before, it's like, it's like uh, having, you're know, building your own lightsaber. Because you know, like, <laughs> yeah. they like cook their own, like whatever, the crystal, kyber crystals, you've got to cook them, you've got to know how it's done. And then you've got, then you've got your own lightsaber and you become a Jedi warrior. It's the yeah. same thing with like the Electro dream. It's like to become an Electro god, you must first construct your 808. Um, I mean, yeah. probably otherwise you would have to go on a pilgrimage to like a pawn <laughs> shop <laughs> Detroit. in Detroit and <laughs> yeah. like find it. And like this guy will be like... Some guy gives you some sort of... Like, ah, interested in the old stuff. <laughs> ah, well, come right through here, young man. I have something that <laughs> may interest you. <laughs> He's like, it's only five dollars. It's like, oh my God, it's an 808. But it's like, you've got to leave a part of your soul... Or like put a part of your soul in the 808 for it yeah, to, yeah you've got to give like. up something to to get yeah. it like your vision yeah. for the next 50 years or something let's talk shall we about um your work for future music and yes. sound on sound yeah tell me a little bit about what you do for them so well i don't i'm not sort of i've stopped doing it um but uh, for a time i was just well Initially, I wrote a big big ass article for sound on sound which was actually like the front cover article for sound on sound in like wow, april 2013 so it's yeah like, I've, li I've been reading it and it's like <laughs> that is like that was like when i saw that i was like 
oh my god, <laughs> this is amazing. It is, yeah, Just it's, it's a really good achievement. Yeah, it's yeah. like, I, you know, I read Sound Up, but to be honest, actually, the mag I read when I was just starting out, when I was 16 and getting into this stuff, was Future Music. Mm-hmm. So in a way, it was like more of a buzz to my 16-year-old self to to like write so for like uh, half a year or so i was doing videos and like modular reviews for future music and i also got to wrote, write an article a little piece about the juno 60 as well and stuff like that. so just doing a bit of writing just from knowing mm. some of the people who write for it um but that was pretty it was like there was a sense of like achievement unlocked when it's like mm. you think i when a little 16 year old oik like learning about the novation nova and like putting together a shopping list of like synths and stuff and like f- like studiously reading this stack of future musics that i had mm. it's like now i write for that you know i have written words for that magazine i made demos you know, I remember listening to those demo CDs and I'm like recording a module that I had to do a thing and like printing out like eight mad things and just thinking, oh, people are going to be listening to this. And like, I remember like... People who know their shit. People who know listening. their shit. Like, well, just people, well, people who don't know their shit. Are people oh, who are like... True, yeah, absolutely, both. People who are just like, who will be hearing this stuff, hopefully getting that kind of thing we were talking about where it's like, you know, the kids hearing new sounds. It's like you hope that someone's going to hear it and be like, oh, my God, like that thing's like, what the hell? Mm. Like, I, re- I still remember listening to the Kawai K4, K5000 demo that was on a future, one of the future music CDs. Mm. And I can't remember what the sound was specifically, but I remember there was some sounds on that, like the little CD. I listened to that. I was like, oh, my God, like that machine make some truly otherworldly sounds like yeah. that does not sound like anything else i've heard or anything else full stop and I, i'm pretty sure the k5000 is still well thought of as like a core i think it's, is it added, it's additive isn't it it's like uh i don't know i don't yeah. i'm not i don't know it because uh, kawaii oh. kawaii is like <laughs> one of those brands that just do not it's never been sexy yeah <clears throat> yeah 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 but they they made some cool weird things like yeah the K, i had a k4r for a while which was like a wavetable sort of synth which was decent i don't know why i got rid of that mm. I, think I, like, I think there's a rule that like one in five people has to own one kawaii, kawaii device, device at some and, point and, and 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 specifically talk about it when you go around because i know everyone who's had yeah. one has been like oh yeah it's the k1 but no one's got the... one now have they do you know actually also with the kawaii trip um one of the great like electro like spooky sounds like you know lfo and LFO, LFO, yes, you know, like, put it on vinyl, yeah. Yeah, you know that weird, like, the, the opening chords, like the... Like that weird, ethereal, haunting sound, mm-hmm. that's a Kawaii K1R. Is it? And that's a preset. I was going to, yeah, that's I was going to say, is it a, or like the booting up sound or <clears throat> well, something. Well, <laughs> I heard, like, if there is a link I can find for you where you can go, and it was like a demo record for the K1R, and there's a... There's one of the sounds on there. When you hit play, it plays not only the like sound that is on LFO, LFO, but the exact synth line as well. And I'm like, hang on, is that just like four wavetables with a bit of like spacing on the timing? And actually, when you hold a note, it literally plays those four notes in yeah. succession, mm-hmm. which is to say so that not only is it a preset, but even the melody was a preset. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like the melody is baked into the sound. It does. I, I think that's a really satisfying moment when, as a synth <laughs> enthusiast, you listen to a track and you go, boom, I know it. Boom, I headshot, know that one. Got it. Or if you know, like, oh, well, that's a preset, and you go, oh, fuck, he's a preset. Yeah. Really? What the Do fuck? You know, like, the, um, well, it's also like when you hear a sample and it's, you know, like something that you've heard in an old hip hop record or something, and then suddenly mm. you're like, there's like Radio 2's on in the background and they're playing something and then suddenly just like there's a breakdown for like two 1.7 seconds you just hear the sampling like oh my god that's so and so and you have this weird like deja vu sensation you're like I know that yeah. but I only know that one bit and you're like oh that's that's from that record it's like yeah the best a- example of oh go on yeah no that's, a, that's it <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't think of any example the best example is that there's a vinyl called English with a dialect no British with a dialect or is it called English with a dialect it's a vinyl yeah. of, of regional accents all around the UK that would be ma- I love that and one of those is in Yorkshire and it's a guy going mashed potato mashed potato you know, why, why don't you, don't like, you mash- like mashed potato mashed potato and yeah, I, I, I bought it from a charity shop and I was listening to it and I was going 
Oh my god! Oh my I god! That. I it's mashed so potato. Fixed. And then yeah, I, I, I like yeah. A, a few mashed, years later, it mashed came potato. Back like, no way. <laughs> mashed potato. It, yeah, it's English with a dialect, and I think Amazing. I now own like two copies of that of that record, having seen it and gone. Do I just you, buy it every like, time I see it. Beat juggling with <laughs> <laughs> potato, 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 potato. Yeah, with toe, different toe, toe, different toe. regional accents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I would I would like that. I do big fan of regional accents. Let me see. Do you have a record collection? Do you collect? I do not collect records. Oh, okay. No. Let I me see. If I have I two actually, copies. I'll send I own you one. one. I do own Amen Brother. I did buy that, and I've like given it to my brother, who does have a record collection. My brother's like a DJ. Um, but mm-hmm. um, I, I was just like, I want to own a copy of Amen Amen Brother. Mm. to have it to the break yeah. I want to have the thing I want to play it and I want to I was then going to like do a really really HD rip of it <laughs> and then just be at least if I rinse this break it's my copy and not just that crappy one that I've downloaded off the internet yeah, everyone's yeah. got that wave file I really like there was someone who did a um, a wooden sculpture of the waveform the Amen Break as oh, a yeah, waveform yeah, carved yeah, as a, and I was like wow that's such a fantastic thing It's so because t- it's a waveform it's made out of like an organic object and it's such a classic waveform you can almost look at it and go oh it's the amen break you know it's, no, I it's almost that, shape. That. Yeah. For, for the really nerdy people it, it's one of them ones um break meisters cool so you now you now uh you now live in london fox you see a little fox on the thing yeah well that's that's the sign that i live in london is there's foxes, foxes. literally at the window yeah um, they're they're looking at they're on up your gear i think i they think do, they might yeah, be sort of like, Ooh, have a go on that makes some <laughs> little foxy breaks the um yeah i do live in london but i'm from yorkshire mm-hmm. originally that's not i i sort of don't sound like it I've you got don't know weird don't. slightly southern affected thing but i think that's why i was talking about accents it's just like accents that i'm gonna try and sound more you can you can go back into like it, i can go back now. into it like i don't I, I, no, I'm, I'm going to leeds now like, sound like div kid <laughs> but yeah like but that's not my you know, my voice I don't sound like that and i've spent too long in london and i've spent too long sat next to people who are from london mm-hmm. so it's sort of that like lil you like take it on but i think it's I don't know if it, I blame partly like being into sound and things like that because I just I can't help but absorb like someone's accent. Do you mm. not have that? Like, mm. do we not all have that to some degree? Absolutely, yeah. And like, also- it is a known thing that like ra- part of rapport is assuming the other person's both body, like you know the way they're holding themselves, mm-hmm. blinking patterns, and like speech cadence and stuff like that you know definitely that, that is a part of a conversation it's like you know, that's what we're doing right now and it's like literally but so therefore but if you do it long enough you do you know like people who move to australia they pick up the like going up at the end right? <laughs> that whole thing it's like you can't help it and then like i know family friends who've moved to canada and stuff and they're they're, they're already like well in fairness it's been here a few years but mm-hmm. they're getting that lilt you just can't yeah. help but suck it up that whole like but yeah. yeah, I think I think it, that's one. It's like a, a thing of being amiable a little bit as well, yeah. isn't it? It's being with people and and adopting a little bit of what they do yeah. in order to yeah like, make like them more comfortable. To America, like you would you would sort of say cell phone. Like I do say that. Like I went, you know, I was in America very recently. I was like, you say cell phone because if you just say <laughs> mobile phone. Although with that said, like no, it's a mobile actually. It's, it's, I'm going to I'm going to. Re- we invented the language. <laughs> I'd, I'd appreciate it if you spoke it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to speak it yeah, properly. Speak it properly. But the, do, you do, you're doing it an injustice, actually. Yeah. It's, it's not a couch. You don't want to be difficult, but I'm, I'm going to correct you on that. <laughs> Someone's got to. Um, yeah, like I did. I, it was funny. I was like, I was talking. I asked a question to an American who kind of. I asked it like a question about completely about electronic music equipment that we were talking about, and the person just sort of stared at me for a moment. He said. I'm really sorry. He was like in American accent, I'm not, which I'm not going to do. But he, mm-hmm. he was like, "Do you ever get this thing like when people in another accent speak to you, like you're just compelled to answer in their accent?" <laughs> and I think, but I was like, "Not really. Not really sure what he's talking about, mate." Like to that extent. But I think it was just. I think for Americans, the English accent is. I've been reading a bit about that. Like maybe that partly mm-hmm. attributes my success on like YouTube and things. Yeah, it's like the, this voice, like. Hello, I'm English. I'm here to tell you about synthesizers. Exactly. <laughs> Would you like exactly. to know about that? 
It's like... it, uh, I lived in Brazil for a year as well, and they uh, if you if they love it in America, then in Brazil they're like they, they go more. wild for it. You know the video Charlie bit my finger. Yeah, I remember they'd just be like, oh go on, just say just say Charlie bit my finger in your really? lovely British accent. <laughs> they just they love it more. They it's they in Brazil they love it. Yeah, they love the way we pronounce the T. You know, we're sort of it's very sort formal of. and articulated. How well, how do they because, pronounce T's in Brazil? Uh, well, if they were speaking in English, they'd just use an American accent. They'd say butter. 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 Whereas I'm there going, butter. could you pass the butter, please? Butter. <laughs> Whoa, I love his accent. You sound like me in Hogwarts. <laughs> butter. <laughs> but there's a really good episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Oh, okay. Uh, where Shaquille O'Neal, for some reason, is, <laughs> is, is pronouncing the word butter in English. And, and there's no explanation butter. why. <laughs> he's American, but he's pronouncing it with a T. And, butter. Um, butter. It's just a... Brilliant detail. <laughs> cool. So I th- the first time we met was um, you were doing some, showing off some lovely Moog synthesizers. Moog stuff. Moog, yeah. Moog, 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 sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, right. right. The Americans will be very upset. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, yes, I was. Yeah. 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 That's like day job stuff, like showing off. Um, but yeah, it was, um, we were there with James Wiltshire talking about synths, mm. showing people synths. It's fun doing the whole, like, doing it face to face is also very fun and gratifying. The, to go on a slight tangent, which doesn't really, although I hope for that's what you were up for. But um, I did a show in Yorkshire, up at, actually very close to my parents' house, um, but at this Deer Shed Festival, um, which was brilliant, actually, because it was like, it was basically the guy from Deer Shed, it's like a family festival up in up in Moldersby, up in Yorkshire, North Yorkshire. Mm-hmm. And... Um, they basically wanted because of the videos wanted me to come and talk about modular synths to okay. kids so it's a super family friendly festival it's like literally pretty much exclusively families and their kids so like anywhere from you know well babies to sort of 10 year old 15 year olds or you know thereabouts and it was really like it was incredibly fun to show kids how to use a modular synth in a way i've done like four day shows showing adults how to use modular synths i don't want to be mm-hmm. mean about adults but i'm just going to go out and say it was really nice to show kids yeah how like mm-hmm. no one is more up for it and like buzzed and like has a like the faces light up and they're just kind of up for trying things and it's just like that innocence and it's it's new I don't know. It, yeah, it's just I, way more. It's way more gratifying. I was like, I actually really enjoyed it. I was like, this was. I feel really glad. I'm really glad that I did this because definitely. it was like, you know, it's it, you know, get paid to stand there and you know be there all day. But I was like, this was this was great. It was I, like, yeah, was so that, much fun. Yeah, because you, also, also yeah. they're very responsive. So you you can feel you show them how to do something. Like you say, their eyes light up. Yeah. And then they take that further and they start to try and experiment that. So there's no inhibitions. Whereas absolutely. with an adult, they're like, oh, I don't want to look yeah, like well, an it's, idiot. It's or, like when I say to the adults, the adults would absolutely engage you and were interested in the system as well and were chatting. And, you know, there were a bunch of adults that I showed it to, but definitely the kids are more up for it. And also, I think probably partly also, I just harbour this like secret joy Joy, I hope that that kid might get into electronic music just because mm. of this little seed. And I would literally, I would do this, I'd develop this routine where I was like, all right, we'll start off with the circadian rhythms. I'll teach you how to put in a bass drum and you're putting in like a brutally hard, like, you know, kick. And it's just like, <laughs> gather <laughs> kick drum. <laughs> and it's like seriously killed. It's not like a sort of poopy little like Cubase, like PSR keyboard. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then it's like, then put in some hi hats. We put in a hi hat pan. Then I'll teach you how to use the like, um, the branches so that we can do some like generative stuff and have like the mm-hmm. hats. Did you hear how well, the hats will only go to one place if it's all the way counterclockwise? And if you put it fully clockwise, then it goes to a different place. I'm like, yeah, yeah, mm. I can do that. So you don't have to do as much. Now let's get on, get a synth line going. And they're like, you know, brown, 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 brown. And then it's like, and then you get, get the hands on the fills. I'm like, right, you see this big dial, right? Okay, this is, this is, this is, a, this is the frequency it's, control. Yeah, this is cut off. everyone loves. Isn't Welcome it? to <laughs> the cut off knob. You've never, ever played with a cut off knob before, but today you're going to like turn that. 
do you hear that there's this magic point where it starts to make this kind of sound now turn up this one labeled resonance and now do that again very slowly and it's like literally like forcing someone to like first experience an analog synth like sweeping and sliding. Yeah. And then you hear, I'm like, can you hear that magic point where it really makes this lovely squelchy burbly sound? Now keep that moving while you push this switch to take the bass drum out. So take it out, but keep your hand on there. Don't move your hand. And mm -hmm. it's like, keep it, keep it, keep swirling that, keep swirling, keep swirling. Now, now when you're ready, flick that switch and mm -hmm. the bass drum will come back in. And then they do it, and then it's like this big smile on their face because they've heard like the drop, and then they're like the come back in, which is just techno. It's just like take the things out, put them back in. Yeah, take them out, put yeah, them yeah. back in. Or like you're not having that just yet. Yeah, no, yeah. Or, that, did you like the sound is. of that? You can have a little bit of but it. It's like <laughs> even a little kid who's never listened to, and I, you know, and a couple of the little kids, I was like, the, the couple of kids were like, that was amazing. I really enjoyed it. I was like. That's called techno. <laughs> Write that down now. Techno. techno. You like... Big capital letters. You like Underline techno. It. <laughs> so I just want that kid to go back into their school on like Monday and be like, I'm into techno music. Like, damn right you are. Yeah. Damn right, kid. I don't like, I don't like, I don't like Miley Cyrus. Miley, Miley fucking Cyrus. Yeah. I like techno music. Like, I good on you. Yeah, that was really gratifying because, like, um, yeah, I worked in community music for a long time as well, and like, it's so much fun working with kids. And we'd we'd work with neat children who are not yeah, in education, not in education point. employment, so or it was training. pretty tough in South Wales doing that. But yeah. what I did was I made Maximus P patch uh, with a PlayStation controller, nice, so they could control like Reason yeah. with the PlayStation controller, like the beats and and the synth lines and the arpeggios and stuff. And that was such a great mm. in like access for them to get into electronic music. You know, they'd start off the session going, oh. Oh, I'm going to make music. We're doing yeah. some rapping, but the moment you showed them a PlayStation <clears throat> controller and the connection to the, the making like, music, like, yeah, yeah, the face lit up, and, it and it's, it's so also fun. that's what I was getting at before with making a groove box is especially with like Max MSP or Pure Data. Although those things are probably not easy to get started with, well, they're not. The scope to build a like jamming system, if you can do it with a PlayStation controller, you don't need much. Mm. And also, like the things that I'm doing on the modular, I don't have that many immediate controls. I reckon you could totally build like an amazing groove box that was like software controlled. But it's basically, I'm just describing Definitely. the push. Just... I have, I have, I did, there is a really early video of mine, maybe it's eight or nine years old, where I made a thing called the Midi Era Groove Box. Mm. And it was wicked. It was really, really good. Loads of bit crushing and sequency things and a ma rooting matrix. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I often <clears> think <throat> I should go back to it. Um, it's like the, um, it. that um, Tim Exile's like flow machine. Yeah. Um, yeah, Flow Machine is a really good example of that. It's just like an amazing groove box where it's just a couple of shitty Behringer controllers. Mm. And he's turned it into the most gratifying. I mean, he should just release that, but I know he won't because he's obviously like, you can, you can have elements of what I've done, mm. but you can't have the Flow Machine. Yeah, I think I'm he's built it from the ground I'm up. I'm a job if, if other people get the Flow Machine. Because I think there was a time when it was like Beardy Man and... At Beardy Man and Tim Exile were sort of doing a similar thing. Yeah. And they were sort of in the same ballpark. And Beardy Man, I think it was Sugar Bites, he's he paid them to like make his He's done a, like he's done a similar thing. Pounds, like in a iPod lots of basically turning their Sugar Bites plugins into a, a whole system. A system Whereas Tim Exile has essentially just done that himself. Yeah. You know, without bit any bit, investment. Without involving sugar bites. It's yeah. taken him 10 years or whatever. I think he's brilliant. And he's also agreed to be interviewed. Oh, he's sweet. He's going to be hopefully in this series. Well, what I, what you, my question to Tim Exile to pay it forward is to ask him, I just want to understand the core of how it works and how to apply that. How can other people make a groove box out of a computer and a basic MIDI controller? Mm -hmm. Give people, arm people with enough knowledge to be able to make music in a gratifying way with a limited amount of controllers but a lot of software running behind the scenes because that would be cool yeah like, it's would... a reactor isn't it you, yeah. you just need to really get your head around reactor. Right, like reactor blocks also that's like yeah if you're at all interested in the eurac thing is don't bother and just play with reactor blocks because mm -hmm. for like what 160 quid for reactor yeah you can legitimately build a, a modular groove box and very 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 easily assign midi controllers to those knobs and just build a generative algorithmic drum sequencer 
and you know where you can have like one macro controller that mm -hmm. will control 10 controls positively and negatively and sort of say i want more drums i want less drums those are the kinds of things that i'm doing with the, the modular it's like turn one dial and just get more of something mm -hmm. you can easily do that in software you just and you can just decide more midi controllers to it definitely just and buy think... a load of shitty midi controllers <laughs> it'll cost you you could spend 200 quid and buy like all of the 90s shittest MIDI controllers, but end up with a better, inter do you know what I mean? Like a yeah. custom interface. Totally like, customised. Like I think that's... rip them apart, you know? If, even if you just bought like 10 UC16s, like the Evolution controller, like mm -hmm. you'd end up with 160 knobs mm -hmm. and it would probably cost you about 100 quid. Yeah. So those things are a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> they're always on e Is it the they're UC33s? They're yeah, always yeah, on the eBay. Like, broke it. There's, they've always got oh, like problems. But um, yeah, definitely. I think that is... Yeah, <clears> software... <throat> I think that's good advice. Is like, if you if you are interested in modular, then yeah, Reactor Blocks is a if really good introduction. Just to test the water. I mean, if you're interested in hardware, play with software first. But then... But just you can so easily turn hardware... Software into hardware... With a basic, just think about the ways that you can macro assign, you know, uh, build your groove box and then just think, can I pair my groove box down to 16 controls and have a go at assigning 16 controls? You can presume, mm -hmm. presume you can assign a MIDI controller positively and negatively to more than one thing in blocks. I don't know if you know the. Do you know what I mean? I said, so you can have like one controller that controls fifteen different things. At I'm the same sure time. you can. I, you could definitely do that in Reactor. So I, and I think Reactor's like yeah. Because the then you can like have gain compensation on filters and things like that. You know, when you turn it up, it mm. both turns up the level and the resonance and stuff like you know. I you see. Can, yeah, to keep like a unified keep the levels sound about level, right. Even though you're going <clears throat> yeah. down in the yeah. the cutoff filter. So you mentioned about having a <clears throat> hearing problem. Yes. Which is, it's maybe a bit of a taboo subject in the music it industry. Be. It's Let's something... talk about it. Yeah. Uh, because you're an idiot if you don't talk <laughs> about it. Because not talking about... It's like basically this idea that, I'm, let me go on a rant, that it's not cool to wear earplugs. It's like, and I'm going to parrot some of the things that other people have said because I agree with them. Mm -hmm. Like, n if you stare at the sun... You're a dickhead. Like, yeah. No one thinks that staring at the sun is cool. Yeah. Everyone thinks you're a knobhead. When Donald Trump stares at the eclipse, he's ridiculed on Twitter. Yeah. Um, even more so than normal. And quite rightly. Like, <laughs> quite rightly. And it's just like, and it's no different to listening to rinsing drum and bass at 130 decibels. You are doing the audio equivalent of staring into the sun. Mm -hmm. You know you'll burn your eyes if you stare in the sun, and you also know that you will damage your... Well, maybe we maybe we just not talked about it enough. You know, everyone says, oh, you know, you should protect your hearing. Like, protect your hearing. It's like, you know, it's important. But no, nah, no, nah, it, it really... Like, you actually probably have already damaged your hearing. Yeah, it's irreversible, isn't it? The problem is that you've it's already happened and it happened sometimes it can happen overnight if you're exposed to something very loud, but it will generally be a slow creeping thing. Mm. And like that whole thing that, you know, if you put a frog in boiling water or put a frog in cold water and make it boil, the frog doesn't feel that it's boiling. You don't know that you've damaged your hearing because it's already happened and yeah. you're very used to hearing the damaged version of your own hearing, mm -hmm. but you don't realise what you're not hearing. Yeah, and I think <clears> the <throat> brain adapts to it, doesn't it? It, it does. Picks, it will pick up things, but yeah, I guess so. It, but you don't like... hear those frequencies again. You just you just get used to not hearing them. Yeah, um, that's true, yeah. Uh, but the, the problem, like the, the real issue is that if it goes really south, you'll get things like tinnitus. So you'll get ringing permanent ringing in your ears and you will mm -hmm. never experience silence ever again yeah um so the, and i'll make it practical so well i'll talk the issues that i had was so um i was born with a cleft palate so that's when you know you have like that kind of hair lip thing where you've got like your lip is like split and stuff because you didn't your mouth basically your mouth starts off as this weird shape and then forms together mm -hmm. but it didn't form fully it actually wasn't my lip but it was in the back of my mouth right so if, if you ever want to see inside my mouth uh you're very welcome <laughs> but um it's got i've got scars a huge scar where i had 300 stitches when i was a little kid wow. um 
And that was when I was very young. And, um, and basically, like, literally when I was a little baby, I couldn't really drink milk and it was, like, snorting out my nose because it was just open in the mm. roof of my mouth into my nasal cavity. <clears throat> And so, and that's a real, obviously that's an issue. You've got to get that sorted out. I had stitches, 300 stitches when I was three months old, sewed it together and gave me a roof to my mouth. I had like speech therapy when I was younger to make sure that I could talk properly and use my mouth because I do have a str an oddly formed mouth. So I had this cleft palate. The problem with your ear, nose and throat, which is the reason that there is like a hospital that just does those things, is that they're all connected. So if something goes wrong with your ears, then possibly it will affect your nose and throat. And so mm -hmm. there was always a possibility that my ears were going to be screwed. I had grommets in my ears when I was a little kid. Um, and this is all very long winded. But the point is, um, there was always potentially going to be something wrong. And it turns out that that thing that is starting to happen, which is I went and got my ears checked out um, because I was mm -hmm. getting some earplugs, like professional earplugs fitted, which, by the way, is not that expensive. 120 quid, 130. Mm -hmm. And you can have some proper molded ones uh, that don't. To your own yeah, exact. To your own ear exact cavity. thing. So they're, yeah. they're comfortable. And also, just very quickly, if anyone is ever even is thinking, oh, I don't wear earplugs because they make music sound bad. Just the same way that you've gotten used to your really damaged hearing, you can get used to earplugs. The mm. trick is don't put your earplugs in when you're already in the venue. Put them in 15 minutes before you get to the venue, 15 minutes before you're in the room and you're actually in the environment. And it gives your ears a chance to acclimatise to the new 15, 20 dB reduced thing. And mm. it will then sound normal. Like, very good advice. Um, you're going to still feel bass because you feel bass through your physical body and it can still, you can get, you, if you get the professional ones, um, I used a company called Hearology in London, which I 100% recommend. Mm -hmm. Guy Vincent Oliver, just Hearology, Hearology. They are awesome. Um, and what they, what they did for me and they would do for you is you get a proper test you, they check all of the issues with your hearing. They give you a, a, like a readout showing you where the damage, if there is damage, what has occurred. And then they do these fitted things. They do like 3D scanning. And I basically almost become like a, a shill for them because I believe very strongly that you, you will too. If you it's go important. for that test yeah, and you, just get, you see a big notch in 4 to 8K like I've got, that is from wearing headphones um, <clears throat> and from like, pro, like gigs other like prolonged exposure mm. the danger is that it can happen as well without um without it being necessarily a big loud thing um yeah any, like... basically any well here's the like i don't i'm trying to like think of a way of putting this that isn't really boring because it but it's really important my basically my other problem was that my because of my ear nose and throat my eardrums are always being pulled in all the time and I thought, but if your eardrums are being pulled under tension because there's like a negative like vacuum in my nose, in my inner ear, I was thinking oh, that probably just like affect high frequency, It'll make it harder to hear high frequency, but it doesn't. Mm. It makes it harder to hear bass because your ears need to, your eardrums need to move the widest amount to perceive bass. Mm. And it turned out I had this slightly horrifying moment when he said that. And then I was like, what? And then I went home and I was listening. I basically got up Ableton. I got EQ8 out and I was playing. I could see all the frequency bands and I was did a high pass and was sweeping a really peaky high pass bass thing mm -hmm. around between 0 to 120, 250 hertz. And I couldn't hear the thing changing. I was like, you are fucking kidding me. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'd, I'd masked it to myself because I'd been like, I would, playing music in a big venue you feel the bass as much as you hear the bass definitely so definitely. It, it masks it's a combination that. of the two and so it? i just had this moment i was like you're fucking kidding me i can't hear bass and i was like always counting on that being the one thing i would still be able to hear when i became an old person mm. but what's going to happen is i'm going to band pass mm. and i'm going to get more band passed as life goes on and i'm <laughs> i'm just going to end up hearing this fucking narrow telephone like the world's just going to sound like a fucking telephone to me which is shit there is um, i've just been reminded I've just remembered there's a film, isn't there, called All Gone Pete Tong, which is about a huge DJ in, losing his in Ibiza losing his hair. Yeah. And he uses, at one point, he uses subwoofers on each foot ah, yeah. to mix the two records together. Well, this, so, so this is the other thing. is like a device that I thought was a gimmick when I first heard it, uh, or tried it, was the sub pack. 
uh, which I've got. There's one over there. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because yep. what the sub pack lets you do is it physically creates the sensation of bass in your, on your back from like naught to 150 hertz. And that thing, and it's, it is, in fairness, really fun as well, because mm. it just makes, it turns headphone music making into like a visceral experience because you're like, oh, I can actually feel the 808 kick drum. It's, it is yeah. actually genuinely quite a good device. Like I would, I would genuinely recommend buying one for, the, for just making music a bit more fun. Yeah. But for me, I, it, makes, I, it means I'm able to perceive like low end issues so for example like the one practical thing is like i'm doing a video at the moment and i was mixing the video without wearing the sub pack and when i put the sub pack on i realized that all of the like bumps i've actually high passed this mm -hmm. but all of the um super low end bumps of my hand touching like the gear i was transferring to the microphone and mm. i couldn't hear it right. um but I could when I wear the sub pack, my back is like, Whoa. yeah, it's, it's like kicking the shit out. It's of just you. like, it's just like, whoa, um, that's like the best eight or eight bass drum in the world. It's like keep doing that, um, and it's like it it is allowing me to continue mixing and to mix probably more effectively than I was doing before because it represents frequencies I cannot hear. But well, it's brilliant. I think that's brilliant that you know there's there's a definite there's a very good thing that's come out of it. And I think also as a cautionary tale for other people, especially people with children, you know, when they're not aware of like looking after their children's hearing when it's forming. Oh, yeah. Well, the, it's the, also the funny so thing with that, the irony is that I see at festivals, you know, like, you know, a deer shed and other festivals I've been to like this year, I see more parents putting headphones on their kids than ever, but I don't see the parents wearing earplugs themselves. I'm like, mm -hmm. they're like, think about what you're doing. Like, it's a problem for your kids, but it's not a problem for you. And, and the, the real issue, the thing to communicate to anyone listening to this, is not about my bass issue because that's not a problem you're going to have. Mm -hmm. But you will get the notch. So I've got a notch at four to eight k, which is about twenty dB, or maybe not that bad. It's like fifteen dB down, mm -hmm. and that is from headphone use and from. And it's so like when you're making music, it's like a slow thing. You just crank the headphone a bit. Mm -hmm. You crank the headphone a bit. Bit more. We've all done <clears> it over the space over of an hour. evening. It's two a.m. and you yeah, take your headphones off, put them down, blasting. come back into the room, and you can hear it almost as yeah. loud as it's on the. It's because, like, as you listen to music, your ears basically compress. They like close up to protect themselves. So that's why you're turning it up is because you're overcompensating, mm. and you're doing it a bit by bit. Now, what the the thing that you need to be aware of is like what how much is too much, um, and basically the rule is eighty five dBA for eight hours will cause damage. And like, how loud is 85 decibel A-weighted? It? It's not that loud. The, the best rule of thumb to work out if something is about 85 is do you need to raise your voice to be heard by someone else? Mm -hmm. That's a good... If you need to raise your voice, then it's probably over 85. And you, what you might know is you start thinking about what situations do I need to raise my voice? Like, yeah, I need to do it in a club. But I need to do it on yeah. the tube. The tube I need yeah. to do it in the street. I need to do it in the car over and like people at work in the workplace. I need to do maybe it at work fan in my office, a fan or something, just to hear. Mm. And it's like, and it's also the thing with dB is it's like a logarithmic scale. I'll probably get this wrong, but basically three dB extra over eighty-five. So eighty-five, six, seven, eight. Shit, maths. I have to count with my fingers. So eighty-eight dB. Mm -hmm. So if you can listen to 85 for eight hours, how long do you, can you listen to 88? It's uh, half of 85, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, it's four hours. mentally. It's four hours and then 91, two hours and then so forth until you get to like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong because I'm just guessing, but like you get up to like 100 and something, it's, oh. it's then becomes 15 minutes and then it becomes like seven minutes, then two, then 30 seconds. Mm. And at the kinds of rates, like levels that clubs are run at as well, depending on where you stand, you are well within those those ratings. And it, it, it is for till six o'clock in till, the morning. Till from, like six in the morning. Yeah. And, I, your ears ring, and your ears ringing is, that means you've broken, you have damaged. Mm -hmm. And you won't, you, it, it's just only a matter of time as you keep doing that. I mean, it's important to say that people are all, I'm actually probably not even going to tell you this, but that, People are all different. Some people get lucky, but you're probably not one of those people. Mm. So just it's not Don't worth, it's not worth, one of those it's not worth finding out, is it? Yeah. So wear, ear, wear earplugs in the same way that you would wear sunglasses outside, but just put them in 
before you get into the club mm -hmm. and tell anyone who thinks that you're a dork for wearing earplugs to go fuck themselves. Good advice. I are, think it's definitely they are good advice. Bellends. It's like literally almost like saying... It's the cool kids in school, It's like the cool it? kids, like, you know, actually what we're all going to do today is like stab our own arms. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you mean you're not up for that? It's like, mm, so I don't want to yeah. do that. Where's your kicker's jumper? Yeah, like... <laughs> <laughs> So, yes. Oh yeah, it's really good advice. That Just, I think it's excellent advice. Like, if you go to a, like an audio audio place, you can get a hearing test. Mm -hmm. with it. You have to pay a bit of money for it, but it's worth it, and it will it will tell you the difficult truth. And I mentioned it on mm -hmm. Twitter, and a few other people have done it subsequently. And I'm now seeing their posts as they have that notch as well. I see, and they're like. Fuck. We all need to use our ears for our jobs, really. Everyone who I'm talking to. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's, there's, you know, it's, it is getting a more prevalent thing, and there are subscription models mm. where you can pay, and I think they give you, you know, really high end earplugs, and um, yeah. So the, the, there's a lot of it's accessible now, yeah. whereas it didn't, like you say, it, used to, it yeah. wasn't. It was, yeah. Do it. Cool. It's yeah. Otherwise, you'll go deaf. Ish. Mm. And then what can, what can you do? Just, just like, braille music from then on? Bass, I would like that. It's always my idea is that I could just make bass music. I could be like, because you could always really like... heavy in the yeah. underground. But then that's been taken music. away from me. So I'm going to be like the mid-range king. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the other thing to mention uh, that's uh, it, it's just been in my head is that um, like modern, modern electronic sort of EDM music that the kids are into, mm. loads of high frequencies, loads of harsh, yeah, high end, harsh loads of... Yeah. white noise white noise almost throughout the whole track on a side chain so um even more so for the young people now with digitally produced high clarity music yeah like you're gonna it's you're gonna, gonna hear be, those it's frequencies. gonna happen quicker probably, they're probably cranking them because they already can't hear them <laughs> so just, yeah i mean i did probably good thing. I, ridiculously <laughs> I, i've been back and played mixes of my own and i'm like oh my god there's so much bass like there's too much bass mm -hmm. in this because that was why you needed yeah. to hear wow it. he really loves bass yeah it's like, just, that's just my signature <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I can't hear it. <laughs> yeah, so you're doing I mean we all we all have different ways of like making money from music now obviously it's not like yeah the 90s anymore yeah so you have a thing called patreon which i'm sure everybody realizes is like a subscription model where people fund, fund your content exploration content funding yeah so what, what what's what's behind that what do you give to people um so it is basically it's like a kind of big digital tip jar so that people who like your stuff can give you money uh people, strangers on the internet can just send you money and actually interestingly predominantly a lot of them are american as well it's like where there is a tipping culture it's like i'll mm -hmm. send you some money um and so it's a way of like monetizing you know a youtube channel or something like that and it's it's interesting because it, it it really it, like if you have a look at it i'm currently up to like 800 nearly 900 dollars a month on it and Fantastic. it's like wow, given how niche like my channel is that's quite a lot of money. And to make that from advertising, I'd need to be like blowing shit up in slow motion, <laughs> doing some, <laughs> yeah. something involving cats on a more regular basis. Something with a microwave. Like putting, things, putting synths in microwaves. <laughs> yeah. Just something. I'd be like, hey guys. I mean, I basically do that anyway. <laughs> like, I need to be like one of those, those people. Yeah. But it's like it allows niche content makers to have like a legitimate source of income, which definitely helps. It, it mm. massively helps. And it's like, it's really expensive. And it's just like, I have had times when I'm like third night in the row of just working five solid hours making a video. And it's like, why am I doing this? And why am I putting this much work into it? Mm. And actually it does, it genuinely offsets that. Where you're like, oh my God, like, no, it's like legit, like a second job. Like mm. these people are really appreciate it and they're sending money and that's how much they appreciate it. And then therefore it incentivizes you to just make better shit. Yeah. Um, I, I really, I do like your approach because that your videos are very professional and, it's, and you're clearly spending a lot of time in the audio, the visuals and also um, articulating simple things. I would say that's kind of my, what I would say my own, my strength because I'm very sort of like blasé about my own knowledge because I'm self-taught. I'm not gone to like audio engineering school. I literally just, 
just started reading future music magazines when I was 16 mm -hmm. and just doing it and have done it. And therefore, so a lot of what my knowledge is, is very practical. I would say my strength is only in, I can communicate and clarify things. So it's, it's, and it's only from having been shit at it and getting done it a lot that I'm like, mm, this is the better way of doing it. Do it like this. Yeah. And it's also being mindful of like the tone of your voice and like, varying the tone a little bit so it's not just like hey guys this is the the model two and like <laughs> it's just like good as that information may be i resent your tone of voice for making me sit through. yeah it just I, makes me want to kill myself i think we've all started to watch a youtube video it's about something that we want to we learn we need to know and about two seconds in you just can't do it you fucking can't <laughs> yeah, do it fuck, fuck that thing. i find the same with um, <laughs> in terms of like amazing intonation and clarity of of passing of knowledge james wiltshire who you mentioned yeah he's got a great his videos voice. are just james, absolutely hello james wiltshire yeah, <laughs> it's, he's so, and the impetus and the gravitas behind what he's saying is amazing. So that's what there's, we're doing today. <laughs> yeah, there's no way. I he's mean, like a children's like he could read children's books. He could type thing, exactly. Like. I said this to him. I was like, you know, your YouTube, kids you... must sleep so soundly. <laughs> yeah, like the stories. You... Great story, <laughs> Dad. You, you fucking nailed that. <laughs> like, yeah. That Pete. That was the best Peter and the Wolf ever. <laughs> ever. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, yeah, I just, it is, just it to is mention good. I'm from it, the other the opposite end of yeah. the YouTube spectrum, which is literally I've just got it working, record yeah. it, say some shit, and put it on the internet, and the, and then yeah, it's just it's just pretty much a waste yeah, of time. Still, all people around, are interested it? in good content, like you said, like people are still watching your R8 video. It's like exactly, but, but I don't talk in it. I think nah, I, okay. and this is what I mentioned to James is that my videos where I don't talk. But you're doing really, it right now. You really can good. you can talk. You've got a voice. I can't. I, I, I'm I, afraid I, I don't. I can't. I, I, I can't, can't edit videos with my own voice or anything like that. But I think doing you these interviews... To, you you become like one of those pricks who like sound of their own voice. Yeah, don't exactly. It doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> you start off... Hey. Like, <laughs> oh, God, don't I sound great? <laughs> it's like, oh, you're not Terry Wogan yeah. anymore, okay? Um, but it's... Um, yeah. yeah but but that, that genuinely is quite good. Like, the Patreon thing that's allowed like a niche audiences to make or well, niche content to be valid because it is super small like the there are mm. not that many views available for Eurorack makers so to sort of to justify the amount of time that goes into it it's really 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 helpful um so what else to say about it but yeah well, you were saying so what you'll see add. i mean you just try and add Try and give people some bonus or give them some. I mean, I am trying every you know every month. There is something extra for the people who will like support you. Yeah, um, but it's just it's just amazing. Like people just give you the stuff. It's just amazing. I mm. think they're just I very you, generous. I guess kind. you could give away like some of your synth presets or yeah, some. It depends. Not everyone's got of, the thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's true. It's deciding what it's just I, deciding what has value. It's like yeah, and it's got to be broad for everyone. You something don't that everyone can get something from. Um, yeah. there's loads of ideas but it, it can be done and the only thing yeah it's interesting and I wonder about because the thing I'm not doing is I'm not making music <laughs> I mean I am making music to a small extent um, but actually that is something I wanted to talk about which is I am working on like a release but I've been working right. on releases for 16 years mm -hmm. and that's I, I am one of the worst people. I might be really good at doing videos and stuff but I'm really bad at finishing and releasing music Yeah, and like you you can have one and the other, I'm sure, but it's just what was I trying to say? Um, basically, it, one of the things I was reading about was like you know I'm looking at the kind of you know people releasing music and the way that it's done these days, and you think, you know, if I release, well, people like my videos, but if I release music, at least I can piggyback on the success of my videos to say that I've almost got a platform from the inside out, mm. and it's it's interesting. I think there may be. That it may be interesting to people to hear that. I have had comments Definitely. with people of like, I'd Absolutely. really like to hear your tunes because I am effectively making mm. music in the videos. But the the weird thing about that, isn't it? I read a comment which kind of struck me where someone said, it's really hard to become a successful musician in the 21st century if you're not already a personality. Mm. Like, what do you do if it's just the music? Like, can you be that good that you'll become a star just from music alone or do you have to Very effectively be like a bit like prince and be also the kind of 
the personality of the person mm. and, and almost have something else because well, it, it's this onus on everyone has to be like a, um, their own marketing department yeah in order to own... have a successful release. exactly and how everyone... are you going to get noticed yeah and, and in, in a certain way everyone is their own pr company anyway with things like facebook and social media you are sort of regulating on what's going to work and what isn't going to work but yeah um cheryl panera who i interviewed um first that was in the first podcast she said that every time she goes on stage it she knows it's a performance it's yeah. not she's not just playing bass and just filling the bass you know she makes sure she's that when herself. she's playing live it's a performance so it's a yeah. spectacle you know yeah and i think yeah i mean that's that's now something that's uh integral but, but um it's, yeah you've got to do it otherwise how are you going to get noticed in this sea of other people doing the same thing yeah i think uh, for me i think the best thing to do is do your thing and and if it's what people end up liking then mm. that's perfect you do have to i, th- I don't definitely have to just make music to please yourself there's no other person you should please and yeah it's like, don't the, try the more, and the more you please yourself the more it will also be like i always find it weird when people say that certain a musician's music is indulgent so mm-hmm. like that's just a bizarre thing to say like of course it's indulgent they're indulging their own their musical fantasies that's explorations yeah. literally what them being a musician is all about and if yeah, you don't allow them the to do end? that then it, they're what's, just like a library musician. That doesn't make yeah. any sense. What's the other end of like um, indulgent? It's just bland, isn't it? Yeah. So you want to be somewhere in between. You don't want to be on the bland side. You want to. Well, just like, gone, like the other end is like, love me, recording. love me. Won't you love me? Why don't you love me? <laughs> it's just like oh, I thought you'd love this. <laughs> yeah. It's like no one. Don't you wants... like the riser? I've got to put a riser in, oh, and I've on. got white noise. Yeah, come on. All the things you said, you like them. <laughs> like no one wants to see that. Yeah. You give me indulgent any day that's fine yeah cool but, and yeah. just one last thing just to tie it tie it up with I, th- I think i don't know um for me like the modular thing and a few of the things we've talked about um about like you're making music video uh youtube videos and and getting <coughs> to where you are it's like trial and error isn't it yeah. i think that's one thing that Which, modular is all about it is, is just doing it a lot will that go in there and no and it won't or it will it's like the only like I don't know what's the best thing to leave people with. It's just like it, it, like making electronic music in whatever form you choose to do it is basically like one of the best hobbies, I think. Just because it's something Absolutely. like wanking that you can do alone. <laughs> and it's great. It's always great. No, um, um, yeah. Just making sure the tone, we Should end we with end the, with the lowest note? tone. We're all a bunch of complete wankers. <laughs> Don't you pretend any other? Any <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, we it's all like, know that <laughs> it's, it's like the best hobby because you can do it w- on your own in a room. Like many music, other, many music great, yeah, we are talking about music, about music. <laughs> and that's it's amazing. It's like you can, and also it's this thing that you can make. There's something I said before, like you can make something bigger than yourself, which is like a really weird phrasing where it's just like it always amazes me when you play back a piece of music that you've made. You're like, wow, this is like like a proper piece of music that mm. i would listen to someone else make, but i made it yeah and it's well, did very, i make it and it's very gratifying because that can happen very quickly and you can do that within a, a space of two hours you can sit down and there's nothing and at the end of two hours you've got this experience that you've created um mm. and you can make that easier or harder for yourself but if you just like enjoy that process it's it's the best thing ever it's like just keep doing it and but only do it to please yourself definitely Mm -hmm. like you shouldn't i mean it's very easy thing to say because we all are harboring desires to become famous and loved and all of these things but ultimately it just is a very gratifying hobby because it's something like it, it's it's like filmmaking, but to make a film is a lot more work. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> to write a play and put, put it on is a lot more work and it mm. requires a lot more people. Whereas making music is one of the kind of few hobbies that you can achieve a lot of just one person. Like, you know, you can be a writer and a poet, but their poet's probably is a writer, a lot bigger. Whereas making music is a pretty good hack. It's like somewhere in the middle. <laughs> it's like just easy enough that anyone can do it. Yeah. And it's it's something a lot everyone loves. So you've got an audience. Mm. Um and you know, it's just it's a very gratifying thing to do. And it doesn't matter how you do it, just just do it. Don't stop talking about doing it. Stop thinking about what gear you use because it really doesn't matter. Mm. It's like you know, it really doesn't matter. 
Like, it really doesn't. And it will genuinely only distract you to just buy loads of analog shit. It will just take your eye off the prize. Yeah. Unless you're doing it with a very, very, very clear system. Like, I want to have that, that, and that. And I'll use those three things to make this EP that I'm calling the that, that, and that EP. Mm. That's a valid way of using hardware, I think, is like... And that's it's something that I've been thinking about in the wake of trying to finish this body of music is like, or maybe end with this very quickly, is like some tenets on finishing music, which is a subject I'm not qualified to speak because I haven't done it. Okay. But I'm just going to say thing, other things other people have said is don't write music arbitrarily without a project in mind because mm-hmm. you'll just end up littering your hard drive with this homeless, these orphans that, that don't have a place. Yeah, yeah, 10 second loops. <laughs> or like genuinely good finished pieces of music, but you have to be like working backwards in this like needle in a haystack of trying to make them fit as a, oh, I've tried it. It's mm. really hard to make 200 tracks, whittle them down to seven and make them fit. It's much better to just write in a time period where you're in a certain headspace yeah. and just yeah. write for a project. So come up with a project, Give it a name, do the cover if you have to, and then finish the music. Mm. And for finishing music, you know, the whole adage is that adage is that the work expands to fill the time available. You know, that one? Mm-hmm. it's true. And if you don't have a deadline, the work will expand in forever. Yeah, exactly. So give yourself give a yourself deadline. a deadline. Yeah. But here's the trick to having a deadline is it can't be just you know, Tuesday. I'll finish it. Make a bet with your best mate that you'll pay them a hundred quid if you don't make the deadline mm-hmm. and that they or like you can sleep with my girlfriend if i don't do it something yeah. ridiculous but it's got to be i think it's got to be money yeah <laughs> probably money is better than just turning your girlfriend into a sort of strange like debt prostitute that <laughs> it's probably not so great yeah but, but set good an, incentive to finish set, the music. Yeah, exactly. Though, isn't it? It's just if like that, I love if her. That was the case. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I actually, love I love you. Him. I don't want you to. Don't want this to happen. Set I know where he's been. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't want. I'm doing it for you. <laughs> and then you have a chance that you you don't want to lose that money. Yeah. Uh, it works. It really works. And then just set a deadline, but write for a purpose. Is not my idea. It's stole that from Chris Randall, and write. For it to a deadline, and then, but I think it's really, I really, really love that idea of putting some kit together for a project. I mm. think that's really nice. It's like I'm going to use just a TX7 or a FB01 to write this project. I think that's mm. awesome. But you need to just stick to that yeah. and do it, and, and start a little folder and set a little mental note that when you've got enough music, and just don't be that precious about it. The other definitely, thing, definitely, I think that's important, isn't it? Don't, gonna, don't. Don't profess to know it all at any point. No, and just just what, just you're just do, setting yourself up. Tell for yourself to say fuck it. So, I mean, that's what the deadline is going to do because you'll just have to say fuck it. It is done. But music is never finished. It's abandoned. Is the mm. old joke. But what I was going to say, the other thing is a couple of other practical things that I've gotten wrong is don't whatever you do when you finish a piece of music it's the best thing you've ever written and you love it more than anything and what you want to do is keep listening to it because you're obsessed it's like this Mm. new little toy i can oh wow i made that i made that i'm gonna listen to it so but what you must not do is export a wave file an mp3 and then stick it on your phone and cane it (laughs) over the next three days Don't do that because what you'll do is you'll ruin it for yourself. You'll get bored of it. Yeah. You'll you'll but the problem is mm-hmm. you'll probably come up with a load of good ideas when you're not near your computer to do anything about them. Definitely. So yeah. what you should do is stay hungry for that tune. Don't export it, but come back the next evening because you'll be desperate to hear it again because you'll be so excited about it. and it's like, you know, you, you know that feeling. And then Play it back with your eyes closed and make a list of notes as you do it. Mm-hmm. Like that bit there. Two minutes twenty three. Exactly. There needs to be a yeah. riser. I do the same thing. And then thing. there needs to be a sick drop, mate. Definitely. Like all the <laughs> But do that in a list and then stop. And don't this I stole from Mike Monday, so I'm saving you from like signing up to his stupid mailing lists <laughs> in order to get that. But try not to listen to it more than two times. I think it's a really good bit of advice. Yeah. But do it in this session. And don't do it when you're in front of the computer and you can actually do something about the tune, you know, and actually make those changes. Yeah. And then listen through. Another bit of advice yeah. that I got from a guy who was in uh, Wire, band Wire, it's like um, punk band. Colin he, Newman's at least. Colin Newman, yeah. He was, it was, Colin. He was at Holy Fuck yesterday. Yeah, I, it was Colin, was I interviewed Colin Newman and he... Oh, wow. 
he said he's like he listens to music when he does takes he doesn't do them as loops he does a full take from start to finish so he'll play an element completely from start to finish so it's a full performance with the natural flow that happens yeah and what he doesn't do is he doesn't loop sections ad infinitum because mm. it's really blinding when you do that as well it like blinds yourself to the wider context especially of the if tune. you get used to doing it Absolutely. for all of your tunes because you, you can almost make like any a... loop work even if it's shit it will sound good if you loop it that's techno in, in a nutshell yeah that's yeah, how my, my live modular works is that i can just loop infinitely and it'll always sound good if you repeat something i think yeah that's what surgeon said wasn't it if you do something once it's a yeah. mistake if you do it four times it's a yeah that, i love that because that was i was like shit man you know, the cat's out of the bag like <laughs> i know this works because that's what i'm doing with my modulars i'm making something random up and just letting it loop and then it becomes a thing yeah. but the problem with that is you lose the context and what you should do is what colin newman says I don't, and I don't do this, but I need to do it, is always start playback from the beginning of the tune and listen as a whole till you get to the point you're working on. And then you, you can take it in the context of everything that's come before it and go, right, this I know now this is what needs to happen. Mm. Because if you just loop in isolation, it's like you're on this musical island and you don't know where you've come from and where you're going. Does Definitely. that make sense? Absolutely. But don't, basically, the, the biggest one for me that I've learned in the last, last m couple of months is don't, listen don't export your tune and listen back it's a really good trick the other one um finally i won't go on about too much is um monitor quiet and not yeah, not only to protect absolutely. your hearing but apparently and i'm i'm bad at bad at this anyway but because i always end up creeping up that's why i've got shit hearing mm -hmm. but it, it helps the mix. If you're monitoring quieter, it forces you to be more careful about the balance. Definitely. Because, and loudness yeah. is gratifying. Loudness is almost a, a, a hack. A characteristic on its own. It's a char it? And yeah, it, it yeah, can allow shit music to sound better than it, it deserves to be. Mm -hmm. That's but, definitely apparent with my music. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, turn it up. Oh, it's, I really like it. The day you discovered the like hard limiter was a good day. Yeah, the, yeah, the what's it, automatic gain control. You the think that's good for like up. five years, don't yeah. you? And then realise, yeah, no. Yeah, it sounds so good. Cool, yeah. well, thank you very much for thank talking you, to me. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me in my house. Oh, it was really good to talk to Mylar Melodies. Uh, he's such an interesting guy, and I think you can tell from the interview there we had quite a lot of stuff in common, which was really great. We had we just covered every single subject in the history of electronic music, I think. Okay, next month I'm going to be talking to someone who is retailing synthesizer products, DIY kits, and all kinds of Euro rack items. So tune in next month. It should be out at the beginning of April. I am Midiera, this is Midiera Meets. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see you again soon.